Welcome to the December 19, 2008 edition of the Open Forum. Again, we have the privilege and the delightful, the very delightful task of looking into the Word of God. That is, it's delightful if we're a child of God. If we're not a child of God, it's fearful. Very, very fearful. It's awesome because the Bible constantly talks about the penalty for sin uh, and uh, we don't really like to read about that. It's God sometimes uses very picturesque or even lurid language in talking about this. Now, before we get into our first caller, a question was raised this week by a caller concerning a verse that many of us have puzzled about in the past, and and I uh, gave an, a very quick answer that was not at all uh, adequate at all. I want to uh, uh, answer that question because it's a very interesting question and also significant. In Job uh, chapter 38, we read, uh, we read in verse 6, whereupon... Uh, uh, it's uh, well. Let, let me start with verse four. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations there? Uh, fastened, or who laid the cornerstone? Thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now the question is, uh, if this is, Christ is the cornerstone, and He, of course, uh, made full payment for our sins before the world was created. Well, at that time, none of us were alive. If it's here, it's talking here about the sons of God, uh, and uh, those are people. Angels are not sons of God. Uh, they're not created in the image of God. Only people are. And so how can that be that when he laid the cornerstone, if that identifies with his, with him bringing salvation already before creation, how can it be that we shouted the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, in order to answer that, we have to look at a couple of passages. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and uh, indicating that they were the vineyard and they had uh, uh, they were out to kill the owner of the vineyard. Uh, and he says, therefore, in verse 41 of Matthew 21, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. He was talking about the vineyard being transferred over to the church age. Uh, and it goes on, Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same is become the head of the corner this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes you read that now the stone which they rejected that's the Lord Jesus Christ has become the head of the corner in other words God is indicating that now that Christ has come to this world to de demonstrate how he made payment for our sins, he speaks of him now as a cornerstone that the builders have rejected. It has become the head of the corner. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, the, the, uh, Therefore I say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken but on whomsoever it shall fall it shall grind him to powder in order where god in other words god is using language 
to indicate the laying of the cornerstone uh, while in, e eternally it was actually done, of course, before the foundation of the world. The fact is that God is focusing on the laying of the cornerstone or the significance of the cornerstone at the time that he came to de demonstrate his his uh, uh, how he suffered in making payment for our sins. Now it says that when the morning stars sang together, who are the morning stars? Well, we have to again let the Bible guide us. In Revelation two, we read in verse twenty-eight where God is saying that to the true believers, I will give him the morning star. Well, that what God gives to us is the Lord Jesus Christ. He must be the morning star. As a matter of fact, in Revelation 22, verse 16, we read, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. So, uh, Christ is the morning star. Well, now it says here in, in, uh, in uh, Job, the morning stars sang together. Does God sing? Well, yes. Remember Zephaniah? Zephaniah chapter uh, uh, 3 in that, in verse 16, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 16, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thine hands be slack. Jehovah thy God is in the midst, in the midst of thee, is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. In other words, God is singing. That matches Job 38. The morning star sang together. Well, wait a minute. This says morning star plural. Jesus is singular. Aha. Uh -huh. But God is plural. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a plural word because there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the whole Godhead is involved in rejoicing because Christ has, is demonstrating the fact that he is the cornerstone. The cornerstone is being laid and, and it has become the head of the corner. He is the stone. And so now, now it says in Job 38 verse 7, <laughs> It's interesting how this verse kind of gets into a lot of other scriptures. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, who are they? Who are they? Now, this is talking about when Christ came to demonstrate how he suffered for our sins. Uh, and, and, and went through that whole action of, of being, uh, being uh, punished even though he had not come to pay for our sins, that had been done long before, uh, before he ever created the world. But you see, the sons of God are those who are true believers who are rejoicing at the time that Christ is being laid as the cornerstone. Uh, first of all, there was uh, uh, Enoch. He's in heaven. He's the son of God. Uh, then there's uh, no, no. There is Abraham. No, excuse me. There is um, uh, Moses. We know that he is in heaven, uh, and we know that there are others who have become saved. Not many, maybe, but a number of them, and they're in heaven in their soul existence. And then remember. At the time that Christ rose from the grave, the graves were open, and many of the bodies of the true believers were caught up and appeared in the holy city, which would have been, they came to heaven. And so we can put all this together. 
that there was great rejoicing in heaven when these people arrived in heaven uh, when the graves were open when Christ re- was resurrected they then they uh, in their glorified spiritual bodies they were caught up to be with Christ and they and those who had come there before uh, either in their soul existence or like Moses and Enoch and and Elijah is a whole personality, there is great rejoicing. God is singing, and he is the morning stars, and, and the true believers are rejoicing because it has been demonstrated to the world, to principalities and powers, and is laid out in our, in our word that he is the cornerstone of the kingdom of God. He is uh, what has made possible the reality of the kingdom of God. Well, I hope this will give a little more understanding to this verse. It's a beautiful verse when we develop it. But now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Campy. Yes. I'm calling from the Pennsylvania area, and I'd like to look at Proverbs 7, 19, and 20. <laughs> Proverbs. So speak, excuse me? Proverbs 7. 19 and 20. Let's and then look. I'd like to make a comment. Let's look. Proverbs 7, 19 and 20. For the good man is not at home. He has gone on a journey, a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. And this is talking about a harlot uh, a, who is trying to uh, commit adultery with someone who ought to know better than going into her. Now, what is your comment? Now, does a good man picture Christ? who has gone back to heaven and the bag of money was took to the wages of sin and he'll come home on the day appointed which be the day of judgment could that picture that yes he he uh, he has uh, it is christ he uh, will come home at the appointed day and uh, the appointed day is judgment day all right i just wanted to confirm that with you and i'm glad you're doing well and may you continue Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Campion. Yes. Um, Could you look at Hebrews 11, verse 26? Hebrews 11, verse 26. Hebrews 11, verse 26. Esteeming. Uh, let's start with verse 24 to pick up the context. By faith, Moses, when he was come of years to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the pleasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now, what is your question? I'm saying that you are doing a good job because you esteem the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of the world. Although they uh, embarrass you and complain, you're still hanging there for God, and that's a great testimony. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, it, it, it isn't a, it is, it's a bargain because you see we can be shamed by the world we can be reviled and we can expect that especially the more faithful we are to the word of God but but uh, on the other hand what is the reward or the uh, final outcome of it we become we are the inheritors of the new heaven and the new earth. We have eternal life with Christ, which is infinite in its wonder and its joy and its value and however we, we want to put it. So it's a, it's a bargain. Uh, so we get shamed. So we get reviled. So we, 
uh, get called names that are misunderstood and what well, it's nothing it's nothing compared with what awaits those who are the true believers but thank you for that emphasis and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello brother camping thank you for taking my call yes i had a question in second peter second peter yes chapter two Second Peter chapter 2. In verse 1, when it's talking about the word bought. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, what, uh, your question is, why? how can this be about about having been bought? Well, when I think of the word bought in that context, I always think about uh, Jesus uh, buying or purchasing, i.e. saving someone, but this verse doesn't seem to be about uh, salvation, so I'm not understanding well, what that word bought means. It's, it's answered in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Now, we already know from a verse, uh, mm, uh, uh, verse uh, 38 of Matthew 13, the field is the world, okay? It's a treasure that's hid in the world. And what treasure would that be? Well, that is the kingdom of God that is hidden everywhere uh, there is a true believer. We're all a part of that treasure, but we're hid in the world. Uh, the which when a man hath found, he hideth. And Christ has found us, and he has, and yet he is, we are hidden in the world. We, we can't uh, point to the who are the true believers. Nobody knows uh, who are the true believers except Christ himself who has discovered this, or who has put this treasure in the world, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he had, in order, in, in other words, he had to empty of himself of all of his glory in order to make payment for our sins, and buyeth that field. That is, he bought the whole world. That gave him full rights to... Uh, to, uh, to take from that world the treasure, and also uh, gave him full right to bring judgment, uh, to bring his wrath on those who do not remain, uh, who are not part of God's elect. And that's, that ties in with the fact that uh, uh, the unsaved who are not elect of God, their false prophets, have also been bought by Christ. Okay, uh, can you also take a look at First John? First John, yeah. Chapter five. First John, chapter five. And if you could explain verse sixteen to me. Five, verse sixteen. If any man see his brother sin a sin that is not unto death. Well, no, every sin is unto death. The wages of sin is death. What in the world is God talking about? Well, let's go on. Uh, he shall ask, and he shall give him the life life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, when we search the Bible, we find that the only that every sin potentially can be forgiven. If we are, a, if we become a child of God, it means that every sin we've ever committed will be forgiven, which means that they did not end up, while they started out as sins unto death, they did not end up as sins unto death, because uh, uh, that is into our death that uh, they ended up as sin unto death of the Lord Jesus. But here it's talking about sin uh, unto our death. But God did indicate that anyone who blasphemed the Holy Spirit and defined that uh, to mean that they believed with their full uh, thinking 
uh, uh, that Christ was under the power of Satan, there was never to be any forgiveness. And that's called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a, that sin is a very, very rare sin. But it was committed by the scribes of Jesus' day, the theologians in the church in the, in the nation of Israel. And they, of course, weren't worried whether they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit because they, they absolutely did not want Christ as their Savior. They were convinced he was of Satan. And so uh, there was no point in praying for them. Uh, they were dead, dead, dead. I appreciate it. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And which verse? Uh, verse 21 to the end. 7. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That day, incidentally, is the day of judgment. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Our spiritual house is, is whether we become a part of the kingdom of God or not, and the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the rain descended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, what is your question? So the question is, uh, it's kind of a comment, too, that after hearing your study about uh, May 21, 2011, I, uh, your books have uh, been in line with the Word of God, and I, it is true. It's been proven. I, I do tremble much more now, and now this passage makes sense, especially verse 21. It seems that all the uh, churches that are left behind are going to be reading the Bible searching for answers, and that Bible is going to be judging them. Is that correct? Absolutely. They're going to be reading this and recognizing that that uh, God never knew them, and uh, they had built their house on the sand that was not upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They This ties in with uh, the numerous times when the Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and there will be wailing when Christ appears, because it will be the most enormous shock that anyone could ever endure, that all their life they had uh, had been convinced that they were a child of God. After all, they were confessing members in full communion in their congregation. They faithfully came. They had been baptized. They had been assured again and again by their pastor that they were a child of God. And uh, and suddenly they discover, and, and, they, and they were convinced that when the rapture occurs, uh, they will be there. They're going to be raptured. And suddenly the shock comes. They're left behind. It will be super, super, super shock because they will know that they are, are subject to the day of judgment altogether. But thank you for calling and sharing. And, and the only way, this, this is why it is so wonderful that God has given us the precise date when this will happen and has assured us that we can, that God is saving a great many today 
it is the day of salvation, but not within the churches where they have the wrong kind of a gospel. It's outside where they are looking at the whole Bible as the word of God and crying to God for mercy. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Is it possible that I, too, might become saved? And God is a merciful God. Now, just because they're crying for mercy, it doesn't guarantee they're going to become saved. But I'll tell you, they will be on the, uh, they will be in a lot different situation than those who are, who are, uh, 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 they at least have a great possibility as they wait upon the Lord that they too might be a child of God. Whereas those in the churches who are convinced that they are a child of God and who are uh, confident that nobody can know the time of Christ's return, He's coming as a thief in the night for them because they are in the night. They are in spiritual darkness altogether. He will come as a thief. And then they're going to have to face this super, super shock that uh, that is it will be awful, awful, awful. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, is there any spiritual meaning in the fact that the surface of our moon reflects the light of the sun? In the surface of it reflecting the light of the sun? Yeah. In, yes. In other, yeah, in other words, there's a... Uh, well, oh, well, go ahead, sir, go ahead. Yes, the moon represents, in spiritually in the Bible, represents the law of God... The right. sun represents the Lord Jesus Christ, and the law comes from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, well, that was a simple yeah. explanation. Yeah, um, um, I thought maybe that I could call you up and ask you that very unique question. I don't think anybody's ever asked you that kind of question before. Also, would it be okay to spiritualize, uh, that is in a Christian way, in a biblical way, certain events that happen in our life, and, uh, for example, some time ago, I was having a besetting sin, and I was driving home from work, and I hit a uh, car. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, well, let's wait for a, a message, and then I'll get right back to you. We have a caller on the line who is asking the question, uh, is it possible to spiritualize certain events in our lives? Just what do you mean by that? Well, some time ago I was driving home from work and I, uh, I was thinking about a besetting sin that I was having and I hit a skunk. Now we know that a skunk is a very smelly animal and I thought to myself, this besetting sin is a stench in the nostrils of God. That kind of stuff, is that kind of thing. I mean, is that something that God would allow us to, to do? Uh, well, I, uh, we have to be very careful with this, but we, we must remember that God is in charge of our lives. And uh, when things happen in our lives, we can look for uh, a spiritual meaning in that. Like we, if we have a, a very a great uh, uh, difficult uh, time, we, we, we lost our business or we had a major accident of some kind, we can, th spiritually, we can think and a analyze it. Is God chastising me? And maybe I needed that. And that, that, in other words, we look for a spiritual meaning in that. Or we might, uh, things might go be going very well and, and yet uh, they're not quite, uh, where it's what's going on in my life is not quite the way it should be and we can ask ourselves is God spiritually testing me he's giving me blessing after blessing that, uh, and yet uh, there's something wrong in my life is God testing me whether I re uh, uh, how I react to these things but uh, so it, it's uh, our life is hid in Christ if we're a child of God and we want we can constantly meditate and think about Christ and and relate him to what we're doing but we want to be careful that we don't I, I heard a preacher once say well maybe 
I, I don't know if he was a preacher or not, but anyway, uh, he was wondering, yes, he was wondering whether to take a certain call to a certain congregation. And then uh, something happened in his life, and uh, uh, and I don't remember the detail at all, but he regarded it as a sign that God did want him to take that call. And I that I would be very uh, 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 very careful about because God does not give us signs, but He does deal with us, and and so we have to be very cautious in this area. Okay, one last thing. Um, do you still um, uh, uh, very much hold to the? Uh, you used to do it a lot, and I don't know if you still hold to the position that First John chapter two verse three is absolutely the proof that someone is saved, or can it all together be possible that somebody could intimately, very intimately, identify themselves with that verse? Well, and, the fact you know, is, it, the, it, it, the, the idea of knowing we are saved is further developed in Romans eight around verse 15 or 16 where it says that God's Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are sons of God. Now, the sword of the Spirit, the God's Spirit, is the Word of God. And the more time we uh, spend in the Word and meditate upon it and identify with it and, and find that we love the Word and we hate sin... We, we really want to do it God's way. We're, uh, these are all things that can begin to give us assurance. I must be a child of God because uh, there was a time, and unless we were saved as a very young child, uh, nor if we became saved later in life, we can, we can know that there's been a tremendous change in my attitude toward the Bible and our, my attitude toward life, uh, uh, somewhere along there, there's been a tremendous change. That because that should happen when God gives us a brand new resurrected soul, it ought to make a tremendous change in the way we look at sin, the way we look at the Bible, the way we look at Christ, and so on. Thank but, you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Kempe. Yeah. yeah I'd like to look at a couple of verses for me here. Uh, Matthew 25, 1 and 2. Matthew 25, verse 1 and 2. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Now, what is your question? I would like you to compare that to Luke 38, I mean, Luke 10, 38 through 42. Luke 10, verse 38 to 42. There we read, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art anxious or careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, what is your question? Okay, my question is, is it possible for a tableau and a parable to harmonize together? Yeah, these two do not do not harmonize at all, because this is not showing that Martha is not a child of God. It is simply showing that she is, uh, is, uh, has her, her idea of how to be most helpful and, and uh, loving for the Lord Jesus. And she was, uh, she, she was the hostess in the home. And Mary, on the other hand, is demonstrating, no, the more important thing is just to sit at his feet 
and be taught by him. But when we talk about the the uh, the uh, picture that God is painting of the five foolish and the five wise virgins, the five wise virgins represent the distinctly true believers who are ready to meet Christ when he comes, whereas the five foolish are distinctly represent those who are not ready they are still unsaved when he comes they're really two different aspects of bible truth but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum oh yeah hello there harold um i have a question uh specifically about the the age of the earth um, I know uh, all the scientists and what they're teaching, you know, the, the kids is the, the age of the earth is really, really old. And I was wondering if, you know, when we talk about things like dinosaurs and things that are millions and millions and millions of years old, how, how is it and what is it that it... Well, now, first of all, true? first of all, uh, the scientists do not want to recognize there is a God who has created the earth. Because if they do, then they also have to know that they have to someday r reckon with God. In other words, they have to answer to God for their life. And that's absolutely unacceptable. Therefore, they are straining like crazy to try to prove that the world is very, very old, that somehow it, it has come into existence without a God at all. There is no God that they have to answer to. Now, in order to do that, they have to make assumptions. Uh, they, there's a lot of things they can calculate uh, very, very accurately, how, uh, how much of this isotope or this chemical is in this rock and what percentage and so on. And, and uh, uh, they, can, they can calculate a lot of things like that. But... They're, they have no way, none, none, in spite of all their uh, uh, talk as if they do have, they have no way to check any of their uh, dates of, of, of past history beyond the written word. And the invention of writing only goes back to about 3000 B.C. or maybe a couple hundred years more, 3200 B.C., or about 5,000 years. Now, they can check uh, what, by their methods of, of, uh, 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 of uh, carbon dating and so on, they can get fairly close to the dates uh, for the past 5,000 years and uh, make necessary corrections as they check it against whatever written uh, information they can find but once they get past that 5200 years they have nothing that is absolute uh, that they can use to check against uh, they can take uh, and so they have to make assumptions and they make an assumption the people do this theologically also they make an assumption about what the Bible is teaching and then they and then they come to conclusions uh, of what the Bible is teaching based on those assumptions. The scientists do the same thing. And, and in that way, they end up with uh, millions of, of years away. And, and they make these assumptions in different directions, in different uh, kinds of, of uh, things that they're talking about. And they kind of think that they're getting them to agree together. So therefore, it must be that they're on the right track. But the Bible is the only document that spells out in written language what happened before 5,200 years ago. And it, it spells it out in the plainest kind of language as it describes creation 13,000 years ago and, and much that followed after creation. It explains where the dinosaurs come from. They are the animals that 
were were uh, instantly killed in the flood of Noah's day. And because of the enormous mudslides that followed and the enormous quantities of water that went all the way up to the high, above the highest mountain of that day, uh, these animals were caught in these mud flows and and because of the pressure uh, and the heat that was generated, they very quickly turned into uh, into uh, uh, sedimentary rock, and they, their bones became fossilized. And so, uh, they are uh, evidence of the flood of Noah's day. They they fit perfectly into the biblical account, but uh, they just allow the scientist who doesn't want to believe in God. Uh, to speculate and and uh, of course they finally write their their uh, conclusions as if they are facts. You can read uh, magazines like the National Geographic or Scientific American or Science and so on, and my, it just uh, they write as if they really know, and they don't know. They're, what they're concluding is based on a guess uh, that uh, uh, because that's the only way they can develop a timeline that's older than 5,000 years. But thank you for sharing your question. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Harold. I have two texts that I would like you to read. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, and Revelation 18, verse 4. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 verse 13. 13. Let's look at that. 12, verse 4. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. In other words, God is teaching there's only one salvation plan, and God doesn't have two or three or four. There's only one salvation plan. Now, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, there God is talking about a time when the organization he has designed, which is the church, the local congregation, have come to an end as representing the kingdom of God and now are being, are now are under the authority of Satan who is typified by the king of Babylon and so the churches have become Babylon. And so he says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you, you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, what is Mr. your Captain? question? Yes. That, that Revelation 18.4, does that refer to the false church, which is Babylon? Well, the false churches uh, are every church once, once uh, 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 Satan, uh, once uh, the church age came to an end. There was a time when there were still a few churches that were reasonably true, although as we search the Bible, we see that already at the very beginning, they were already becoming false churches. Satan was uh, uh, beginning to plague them by sowing tares in them. And, uh, and as we look at church history, and see what has happened to this denomination or that. And we're just amazed at how far away from truth they came. And now when we examine any church today, we find that they don't have any understanding of what the Bible teaches concerning how we become saved. They, they all have a plan where they can, uh, if you follow that plan, you can become a child of God. And that's an impossibility because all the work was done by Christ, and nobody knows who is one of God's elect. And we just have to wait on him as we plead with him for mercy. So all of the churches now have become false, and Satan rules there on top of that. He, has been, he is the man of sin who has taken his seat in the temple. The churches are called the temple of God because they... Uh, had been used to represent the kingdom of God as the temple 
was used to represent the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. So the first text, um, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it spoke of a true church. That was a true church. And then after the true church, you say the false church came up. Oh, excuse me. This is not talking about a church. Uh, this is talking about we, by one spirit, are baptized into one body. Now, this is not... This, depend, this is talking about the true believers in a church. We, we already know from Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 that in... Uh, that in uh, <coughs> we already know from Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 that in any church there are wheat and tares, that there are... In fact, sometimes the number of true believers is very, very minuscule, very small. Uh, and at other times it may be a little more. But just because you're part of a congregation, by no means is that congregation the uh, kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. It has a few people in it that are part of the kingdom of God, and that's the eternal church. Uh, and that's what 1 Corinthians 13 is, uh, uh, 12 is talking about. Those who are truly ba uh, baptized in the Spirit, uh, they, of course, are all the true believers. What is the body, though? What is the body? Is that the true church? Well, but the body... 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the body. The body, uh, uh, the body that is called... that. We can we have to look at the, this in two ways. There is the body that consists of every confessing member in a congregation. That is not the uh, is not the true church. That is a body of believers, but uh, many of them may not be true believers at all. Although we can't separate them. Remember, God said. In Matthew 13, you can't separate the wheat from the tares. From an outward appearance, they all look like they are part of the true church. But then they're within that congregation, there are a few or a little more that are the true believers. And they are the eternal body. And they are the ones that we read about uh, that characterize those who are true believers they are but they uh, they're a different they're they're just a few amongst many uh, uh, they are the the true church that goes on that God is still building today incidentally but he's building it outside of the local congregation but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Pastor. How are you doing tonight? Uh, just say hello. <laughs> hey uh, there. Hi. I'm or, sorry. Or, or, yes. uh, I enjoy, I enjoy your, your replies to everyone, but uh, just making you aware, that gentleman that asked about time, uh, we as Christians, pastors, have a responsibility to answer that in full because a lot of times we forget the physical world. God's time and our time are two different things. You know that as well as I do. And I agree with you. Those evolutionists, they believe nothing can come from nothing, and that's ridiculous. But what I was saying is God's time is very very much different, and those many, many millions of years are the physical aspect of it. We as Christians are spiritual, and that's what the Bible's meant for the well, uh, Excuse me. Excuse me. Time is determined by the sun and the moon and the stars. We read in Genesis chapter 1 that he, that he created the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and were for times and seasons. When we read about uh, something happening uh, uh, so many years after something else or whatever, uh, that is uh, God's language of time, and it uh, coincides absolutely with our time. It is not a separate time at all. And the, the millions of years is simply uh, uh, guesswork, absolute guesswork and pure speculation by the scientists. 
do we ignore our physical world of the reality that exists within the physical world to satisfy our own uh, you know spiritual longing, or do we use the spirit to satisfy our physical no, world? No, no, we, you know the Bible identifies perfectly with the physical world. It's just that the scientists are when they're dealing with a rock, for example, and they're measuring. Uh, the amount of uh, the chemical that's in it. That's very physical, and it's very accurate. They can measure it very accurately. But when the moment when they begin uh, to make uh, assumptions as to how this all began way back when, when there's no way they can check it, well, then they're not dealing with, with the physical world right now. They're, they say they are, but actually they it's pure... Uh, uh, pure speculation altogether. Pure speculation. And they they don't have a different time. That, when they talk about millions of years, they're talking about millions of years of that each year has 365.2422 days in that year. When the Bible talks about years, it's talking about uh, every year having 365.2422 days in it. It is, there's no, uh, a year is a year, but it depends on what you're going to do with that year. I would agree with you, but unfortunately I know the universe real well. And you have small solar systems and large solar systems, okay? And you've got to, if a planet is closer to the sun, I mean, God, everything in the Bible is true. The Bible is infallible. But what I'm saying is time time does co- relate differently when a planet circles around. I mean, for instance, Venus. Venus' is time for a year uh, is very much me. different than ours. No, no excuse and, me a minute. Excuse me. When the moon shines, on the average, it's always 29.53059 days on the average, and that's been calculated very carefully by uh, careful astronomers. And that identifies perfectly with the passing of time in the Bible. There is no difference. Now, we, we think there is a big difference when we read, for example, that on the last day, the whole universe is going to burn up. Well, now the universe goes out there millions of light years in space and those light years every every uh, uh, year uh, light year is uh, is uh, light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles a second and so in a year's time light goes an enormous distance and when you start getting millions of light years you're way out there way way out there and so now you can calculate and say well now, that means that if at, on the last day, if everything is going to be destroyed, the destruction uh, would have to begin uh, millions of years ago because the universe goes out there millions of light years in space. But what we forget is that light is separate from the light bearer. When Christ created the world, on the fourth day, he first, or on the first day, he said, "There, let there be light." Okay, that light goes out in uh, uh, wherever it goes, and there were no light bearers. It it existed apart from the sun, moon, or stars. Then uh, the fourth day, God said, in four days, uh, twenty-four of twenty-four hours after. He said, "Let uh, he created the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he tied those into the light that he had already created, and and uh, so instantly the light from way out there, millions of light years in space, it was already created as light, but uh, before, and it's already seen on planet Earth on the fourth day of creation. Now the same time." Same way, when he comes to the last day, he doesn't have to require uh, the uh, the light from a distant planet, from a distant galaxy, millions of light years out there, 
for that light to finally, that we know about it here, it, God is in charge of light. He can a blank out that light instantly during the, in its total expanse where it goes, because God is God. And so, uh, in, in that sense, yes, we have a different, ans- a different look at what time is. But when it comes to the 13,023 years of the Earth's existence, well, that, those, those days and nights are, and uh, moon phases and so on are just matched perfectly with what an astronomer would look at. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, how you doing, sir? Very well. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any verses that I want you to look at, but I do have a couple of questions uh, that uh, uh, I would like you to answer, if you may. Um, is there any set amount of a love offering that you should give to places like Family Radio according to... Um, how much you make. Excuse me, we'll look at that question right after this message. A question comes up about what what kind of a love offering we ought to give to the Lord. And... Uh, uh, you know, the Bible has quite a lot to say about this. Uh, for example, we read in, in where Jesus was watching people put their money in the temple treasury. And that was a rich temple treasury. And the, and the, uh, uh, the Pharisees and the rich people, they put in generous gifts of gold and silver. And then came along a widow woman. She had two mites, which was just a tiny part of a day's wages for an individual of that day. And she put it into the temple treasury. Now, uh, as far as the temple, uh, when they counted the money, they're hardly even going to notice those two mites uh, because they were so insignificant. Yet, Jesus' remark was very telling. He said, she has given more than anybody else because this was her entire living. Imagine her entire living. And she's a widow woman, and, and uh, what's she going to live on tomorrow? And, and yet she had the commendation of God, of Christ. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, and the Bible says, freely ye have received, freely give. In other words, we don't dicker with God. We don't uh, play games with God. As we uh, recognize more and more, I'm a child of God, and Christ paid an enormous price to pay make me his child, and I love him with a passion. And really, uh, he has put me in this world to serve as his ambassador, and I want to use my life and all that God provides. And incidentally, something we often forget is we maybe have a very handsome salary or uh, have done very well in business, and and we like to think, yeah, that's because I was pretty smart. Well, come on, who gave you the mind? Who gave you a very uh, uh, excellent mind to be able to think through all of these things? Who gave you health and strength so you were able to to uh, stay in this? Who opened the door for that job that you got? And And then we begin to get a little more humble and recognize, well, uh, ultimately it's God, of course. And now, what am I doing? Am I... All that I earn, am I going to use all of that now for my pleasure, for my fun and games? Or did God give me that as a, as his workman, as his servant? Oh, to be a servant of the Lord Jesus and uh, to use our talents to the highest possible degree and whatever he has provided us with uh, to serve him. What a joy, what a pleasure. And so 
on this program, we don't talk about how much anybody should give. That's there. That's the business between that individual and God Himself. And they, every one of us, should be praying for wisdom as to how we are to use what God has provided. And remember, anything we have is a provision from God, and God does give us a very, very. Uh, express command freely you have received freely give and uh, so thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yes hello brother camp and uh, yeah. nice, uh nice to get get through to you today um i have a i have a remark about uh the question that a, a previous caller had had asked and and uh, the statement that he made about the, uh, the the light in the galaxy and so forth. Um, there's actually a new science that has been studied over about the last 10 years, and uh, it's been studied uh, vigorously by the Har- by Harvard Institute of Science, and it's called quantum redshift, which is actually the science of studying the speed of light, and they have actually been able to speed up the speed of light to almost 10,000 times what it's uh, said to be the maximum of the speed of light. So at the creation, uh, when, when you were speaking of the creation and, and the light being, uh, being formed and all that, it is, it is now within thought that it could have been possible that the light that we see that comes uh, from millions and millions of light years away, uh, by our standard at the time that the, that the universe is created, it could have been sped up so fast by by the creation that God made. It could have been 10, 15, 20, 100 million times the speed that we now consider the speed of light. Yeah, now so, we have to bear in mind something. God is the one who created this world and created all the laws by which it governs this world. For example, the law of gravity. You jump into a water and you're going to sink to the bottom. You're not going to walk on water. That's a law that God has established. God has established the speed of light at 186,000 miles approximately a second. Uh, if, uh, if there is through a quantum redshift, they are able to uh, see some other way that light could have moved faster. It was God who established the law. But Christ is outside of the law. You know, when he walked on water, he didn't have to first uh, figure out how to or, or get a set aside to the law of gravity. When he suddenly walks through, come through a wall and he appears in a room, he didn't have to. Uh, he, uh, that was no problem to God. He he is the one who has established the laws. Uh, when he raised someone from the dead, all kinds of laws had to be set aside, and so we 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 don't ha- even have to have to try to calculate what he had to do. All we know is that God is in charge. The, the laws by which he normally governs the universe are to him are absolutely that can be set aside in a split second. Right, but, and that, that's. That, that's that's what my my point was. My point was that we can we can only get a glimpse of what God is capable of and what He has done for us and yeah. through us and and all all that. And uh, people they always second guess. Uh, well, the time frame. How can these stars be millions and millions of light years away? If God created the universe in one day, how is the light getting to us by now? We shouldn't be seeing any stars. But the truth of the matter is, is that if we can speed up the light to 10,000 times the speed, then it's possible that God can, and it's more probable, I would say, that God can speed up the light to a billion, two billion, a trillion times its natural well, speed. Uh, speed of it course. Now, now, now think, for example, just think of this. In the days of Joshua, there was a long day, a day that extended way beyond the normal 24 hours. Now, the sun just didn't go down. And I would think of what that means. 
we have the whole universe or the whole solar system, our, our whole solar system, it's all intimately tied together and, uh, and, and it's held by certain uh, laws of, uh, of uh, gravity and other laws that tie it together. And all of that had to be totally done differently at that point in time and, 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 uh, involving uh, the planets, involving the sun, and involving the moon and the earth. And, and uh, that was no problem to God at all because he is the maker of the laws and he is in charge of the whole thing. Uh, he is way, way beyond our thinking of how he might have done it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello, Pastor. Um, I have a question. Uh, well, it's a kind of a break from astronomy, more like into earthly matters. Uh, it's about the Song of Songs. Uh, I'm just, like, wondering how could it possibly be a metaphor for the church when it is so erotic? Uh, that's my first question. I have another one, but could you please answer this one first? You're talking about the Song of Solomon. How could this be a metaphor? Right, for the, for the church, for the, for the love of Christ. Well, the because, church. because Christ, excuse me, Christ wrote the Bible... Uh, 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 indicating without a parable he did not speak and when we look at the language of the Song of Solomon and and only look at it physically it, it doesn't identify with the gospel you have to look at it spiritually it has to be understood as a metaphor or as a, as a parable otherwise you won't possibly get any meaning out of it now it is true that people in their lust, and I, I know people who have uh, really researched the Song of Solomon, trying to stimulate their own sexual instincts of one kind or another, and uh, that's all wrong, totally wrong. It is, uh, it is making the uh, the uh, Bible a piece of pornography. No, it is. It, it has to. It, it. It's only as we understand it, as God commands us to understand it, as a parable, that it, it, we begin to see the beauty of the language of the Song of Solomon. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Can we look at the meaning of uh, the word stars in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse forty-one? 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15, verse 41. Let's look. At, there we... 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now, what is your question? I wanted to look at the meaning of the star different from another star. Well, in this case, in this case, the God is using the universe as an illustration. You look at verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Now, a terrestrial body is, is something that is, is here on this earth. A celestial body is something that we see in heaven. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Then he picks on a couple of other celestial things. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. Isn't that true? Venus is a brighter star than, than uh, Mars is, and, uh, and they're, they're 
uh, some stars are much more bright and some are less bright. And uh, God is simply using that as an illustration to indicate that they're just so it is. He can, we can have a physical body that can uh, have a certain beauty about it, but there's also a, a body that we will have eternally that will be way, way, way more beautiful and and glorious than our present body. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. <laughs> okay, very good. I've been listening to you for a long time, and I believe with their, just about everything you say is true from the Bible, and you're right on, except they had a question about something as far as Judgment Day. I'm wondering about the men and women that got burned at the stake for their testimony of being Christians, also David, landmates in Psalms, and then also um, the children of today um, are adults that are at the hands of evildoers um, that cannot even help that. Um, what I'm wondering is like in Jeremiah chapter 12, I understand from 1 to 4, that sounds like what I would be saying myself, and then the Lord's answer from 5 till the end of the chapter, I am kind of get lost on. If well, you let's, have time. Let, let's look at Jeremiah 12, verse 1 to 4. We read there, Righteous art thou, O Jehovah, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root, they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins, that's a synonym for heart, far from their heart. But thou, O Jehovah, knoweth me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed and the birds, because they said he shall not see our last end. Now, uh, the, the, the fact is that it, it, uh, apparently, on the surface, it looks like there's a lot of ingest going on. For example, what about martyrs? What about those who have really loved the Lord and, and, and have been faithful to the Lord? and yet they are killed as a martyr. Where here is someone else who is not a child of God, he pretends he is maybe, but, uh, but he is uh, living wickedly, and, and he prospers. He just prospers. Well, the fact is, that, that, that reminds me of Psalm 73. Psalm 73. And uh, the psalmist was having the same problem, looking at the, the he was saying, uh, uh, I was envious, verse 3, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble like other men, neither are they plagued like other men. And they are corrupt, verse 8, and speak wickedly, and and so on. Uh, and he, he was he was uh, saying in 14, verse 14, For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Uh, and when I thought about this in verse 16, it was too painful for me. And then came the answer, verse 17, Until I went into the sanctuary of God. And the sanctuary is looking into Christ who and his word. Then understood I therein that surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? 
as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors, and so on. In other words, what we see uh, is not what is. What we see is someone getting away with murder, <laughs> to use an old phrase, uh, getting away with uh, all kinds of, of uh, uh, things that they delight in that are contrary to the law of God. But eventually, there is the penalty to be paid. There is the fact that they are under the judgment of God. They will die. They will be shamed before God. Uh, they uh, have, have no possibility of inheriting eternal life. They have no possibility of in being inheritors of the new heaven and the new earth. As human beings, that if they had become a child of God, that was possible. But now they've lost that An enormous, enormous uh, uh, a wonderful thing that they have lost and uh, they don't even know about it maybe at all, and nor normally they would not uh, and they've lived out their life but nevertheless the the judgment of God has cost them an enormous uh, a, a lot that, uh, that that is not lost to those who are true believers we 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 have everything we have our life in this world, and we also have eternal life with the Lord Jesus, and we are the inheritors of the new heaven and the new earth, and so on. You think that the the people will know that their inequity is is being punished? I mean, are they going to be punished? Uh, will they know that they're uh, say they're still alive? I guess they would know then that they're being punished. Anybody who dies before the the, before the day of judgment really does not know that they have been under the judgment of God. They may have read something about it, but after all, they have enjoyed life quite well, and, and when they died, uh, maybe they quietly fell asleep in death. Uh, maybe uh, they had a, an illness for a little while and then died, but then they're dead, and that's the end. They, there's nothing else they know. Never again will they have conscious existence. Now, they're, they, are, they, are, they have come under the wrath of God. Their bodies are going to be thrown out of the grave and, and, uh, uh, and uh, shamed before the eyes of God at, on the first day of the, great tribu uh, of the day of judgment. But they don't know anything about this. That's the mercy of God. That is the mercy of God. That all, someone asked the question, wrote me the, uh, the question, how could a good God uh, create billions of people only to kill them because they were uh, sinners and only save a couple of hundred million people for himself who will enjoy the full wonder of being a child of God. That doesn't seem right. Well, the, the fact is, it would not be right if, if, if the traditional view was still held uh, that we had learned uh, years ago in our, from our churches that when we are die unsaved, we will eventually stand before the judgment throne of God, be found guilty, and thrown into a place called hell, where for billions of years in the future, throughout eternity future, every day we're going to have intense suffering, going uh, as God is punishing us for our sins. And that would be pretty horrible, pretty cruel, very, very cruel, especially when we think, of, for example, of little children. Uh, that uh, they that uh, were not one of God's elect. You mean go, they're going to God is going to punish them for billions of years with a frightful torment, uh, 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 with fire and brimstone for uh, for uh, ever and ever? No, no. God is a merciful God. Christ wept over Jerusalem. Christ indicated. Uh, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, they, it's true that they lose a whole lot. They lost all of their inheritance of 
possibly being with Christ forevermore and inheriting the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and, of course, they lost their time on this earth. They finally died and could not continue to have any enjoyment from this earth. But, but then it's all done. It's the mercy of God. And, and from amongst all of these billions of people, he chose some just a very tiny percentage he chose some that he gave uh, that he named and made paid for their sins and made it possible for them to be forever with him and enjoy the fullest expression of the blessings of God but Mr. Camping, why is there always reference to the Judgment Day? And I don't believe that Judgment Day is generic for everybody gets the same treatment. Um, the Israelis were probably punished uh, the 40 years, but um, I think it would be quite different for each person. Well, no, and Judgment Day is, is, uh, is different in that those who are alive at the time of Judgment Day, they have been told in plain language that God, the God of the Bible, is warning that there's an end coming to this world and warning that it is still possible to cry out to God for mercy and maybe you too can become saved. But they deliberately are scoffing at this they are mocking it or they're in denial. They don't want to listen to it at all. And, and in the plain language, just like the people in Noah's day, they were told by, by, Mo, by Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness, that, that uh, the, the day when the flood waters would come and they paid no attention, uh, and so they were destroyed. And so in the case of this, where God is giving us a timeline of two or three years ahead where we can tell the whole world the details of all this end and it's being uh, being uh, scoffed at and mocked at and denied and so on. Uh, there for them, uh, because they are rejecting something that they are, are that they've been told very plainly came right from the Word of God, they also will be extra punished. But finally, uh, many of them will die the first day in that great, great earthquake that will open all the tombs. They're dead. That's the end of their suffering. Others will die in the plagues that develop the uh, having great pain for the next 153 days. And finally, will be will die on the last day when everything is totally destroyed and it, it is no more. There's a total annihilation of everything. But God knows just exactly how he is going to punish each one. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping? Yes. Pleasure to talk to you. Uh, in Matthew 25, verse 33... Matthew 25, verse 33. I don't think we're going to have time to do more than read it. We read there, uh, and he shall let uh, he he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left hand. This is a parable in which God is indicating that at the end of time there is a division of the true believers from the uh, unbelievers, the wheat from the tares. And that's going on right now. As the true believers are are trusting in the Bible more and more, and they want to know more and more about the Bible, what the Bible has to say. But uh, and now we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. Good night.